Hello, my friends. Today we're talking about Berger's disease. I don't know why. It seems like most nurses know what Berger's disease in Raynaud's is, and you can get it on your NCLEX. So let's talk about it. That's coming right up. Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews. I'm excited to be talking with you today about Berger's disease. I was a vascular nurse for a very long time, cardiovascular, peripheral vascular. My first job was on a vascular surgery floor. I'm not sure if they still have vascular surgery floors. seems like a lot of this stuff is done outpatient now, but at one time people used to be admitted to the hospital for several days for their vascular surgery. So that was my first job. Anyway, um, I'm a part of Clinic Reviews, which is the very best NCLEX review in the entire universe. In my opinion, go to clinicreviews.com to find out more about that. We also have streaming services, which is all of our videos, which you find here, plus some other ones um, with no commercials at a fairly low monthly cost. You can find that at clinicreviews.com. And we also have small group tutoring, which is very good. You get four sessions, two with Mark Clinic himself one with me, one with Pete Savard. They're recorded. You can watch them anytime. You can also attend them live. So that's what we offer at clinicreviews.com if you go there. Today, we're going to be talking about Berger's disease. We are covering the blue book right there. You can get it at Amazon or you can buy the app at clinicreviews.com. This is page 159, I think, Berger's disease on page 159. All right. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the questions. A nurse is educating a patient recently diagnosed with Berger's disease. Which statement by the patient indicates an understanding of the disease? It mainly affects the large arteries of my body. This disease is caused by a viral infection. Smoking cessation is crucial to prevent disease progression or Berger's disease primarily affects the respiratory system. So Berger's disease um, is primarily caused by smoking. So not all smokers will get Berger's disease, but all people with Berger's disease will be smokers. And I don't know why that is, but it's an inflammation of the small vessels in the fingers and toes. Y'all, I told you I was a vascular nurse for the first, I don't know, 10 years of my nursing career. And I actually worked, um, on and off at a vascular surgery clinic. So not just in the hospital, but I worked in the clinic. And I saw a patient one time who came in. He had had both arms amputated and both legs amputated. He was continuing to smoke and he was starting to necrose in his genital area. And it was just very, I mean, it was very sad, but it was just, it was just so perplexing to me why people make the decisions that they make. So why would someone continue to smoke when they've lost their extremities and their genital areas starting to necrose. I don't know. It was very perplexing to me. I became interested in trying to understand human behavior. I still don't completely understand addictions. They're very hard to understand, but nevertheless, Berger's disease is a result of smoking and it is an inflammation. So if you quit, if the person can quit smoking, the disease completely, most of the time will completely go away. No lingering effects or anything. I mean, if they've already lost their fingers, they've already lost their fingers, but, um, they, it, it can go away completely. So smoking cessation is the best treatment for it. It reduces the inflammation and circulation will go back to normal. A nurse is planning care for a patient with Berger's disease. Which of the following interventions is most important? Administering anti-inflammatory medication, encouraging smoking cessation, maintaining a low cholesterol diet, or educating about daily exercise routines. I realize I just had a question about smoking cessation. Now I have another one. I'm trying to make the point to you, y'all, that smoking cessation is the number one treatment for Berger's disease. Don't pick something else. Just because it's an inflammation of the small vessels, arteries, arterioles, in the fingers and the toes, just because it's an inflammation doesn't mean anti-inflammatories are the treatment. The only treatment, really, the only treatment is smoking cessation. There really isn't any other treatment. That's the answer every time. There's no better answer. Which of the following statements indicate a patient understands the long-term complications of Berger's disease? I could develop a clot in my lungs if I don't stop smoking. I will let you know if my leg begins to swell. I am high risk for stroke. I need to watch for dying tissues in my fingers and toes. Y'all, there really are no other significant systemic effects of Berger's disease, other than when you have that inflammation, you can necrose, okay? The tissues are gonna die. When you don't get oxygen to the tissues, the tissues die. What do they look like when they're dying? 
they become black. And so they're watching for dying tissues in their fingers and toes. That's, that's what's going to happen with untreated Berger's disease for people who um, are not willing to quit smoking. During a physical assessment, which of the following findings would be expected in a patient with Berger's disease? Cool, pale extremities, warm, flush skin, bounding peripheral pulses, high blood pressure. So I'm looking for um, necrosis of the extremities because that's primarily what I see, but that's not there. So remember, don't just memorize a single answer. Say, okay, conceptually what's going on here? If we have poor circulation, which of these looks like poor circulation? Well, cold, pale extremities looks like poor circulation. So even though primarily I'm looking for necrosis in the fingers and I've seen it before I've seen it as a, as a comorbidity, someone like when I worked on the vascular floor, somebody came in with other vascular issues. They were coming in for vascular surgery and they had necrosed uh, fingers, but um, that's not there. So I'm going to pick the answer that's closest to what I know poor circulation in the hands and the feet look like. Which of the following patients is at highest risk for Berger's disease? Which of the fine patients is at highest risk? So patients, okay. A 38-year-old male with a 20-pack year smoking history and GERD. So they've got smoking, so that's on my, my list. A 56-year-old female with a history of high cholesterol smokes 10 cigarettes a day and frequently eats fast food. So they smoke, so I'm keeping them on my list. An 18-year-old male who smokes marijuana every day and has been diagnosed with ADHD. So the others don't say smoking cigarettes. Actually, B says smoking cigarettes. A says 20 pack year smoking history, which is, which means cigarettes. C is smoking marijuana and they're only 18 and I don't know how much they smoke. And smoking marijuana, as far as I know, is not as high a risk as smoking cigarettes. So I'm going to cross off C, a 72 year old female, female with a history of MI and peripheral arterial disease. So they don't have any smoking history, so I'm going to get rid of them. So I have to choose between A and B. So who is at higher risk? Y'all being male and smoking are the two highest risk factors. So if you have to be, choose between a man or a woman, I'm choosing the man because for whatever reason, this affects men more, way more than it affects women. Which diagnostic test is most useful in confirming a diagnosis of Berger's disease? Chest x-ray, arteriography, MRI of the brain, or electrocardiogram? Well, this is an arterial issue small arterioles. So even though I personally have never sent a patient for an arteriography, the only one that makes any sense is B. That's the only one that makes sense. So it's not a cardiac problem. It's not a brain problem. Chest x-ray is looking for a lung and heart. So that doesn't make any sense. A nurse is educating a patient with Berger's disease about lifestyle changes, which of the following should be included in the teaching plan. Increase caffeine intake, reduce fluid intake, limit carbohydrate consumption, or avoid exposure to cold temperatures. So I'm looking for smoking cessation, but that's not there. So what else makes sense? This is an arterial problem. It's a circulation problem. So which of these things will make circulation worse? Okay. Caffeine intake is going to make circulation worse because there is a vasoconstrictive effect of caffeine. So I, I don't like that one. That's not going to, that's not going to make it better. When I say make it, I shouldn't have said make it worse. Which of these is going to make it better or could make it better? Well, caffeine's going to make it worse. Fluid intake really doesn't have any effect. And I, I rarely tell people to reduce fluid intake unless they have a fluid volume overload issue. Burger's disease, not a fluid volume overload issue. Limit carbohydrate consumption. Carbohydrates don't have any effect on circulation. Exposure to cold temperatures. Well, if you're exposed to cold temperatures, you can vasoconstrict. So if I'm going to avoid cold temperatures, that can avoid vasoconstriction. So it's a circulation problem. So I'm going to avoid exposure to cold temperatures. That seems like the right answer to me. A patient with Berger's disease reports increased pain in the legs at rest. What is the most likely explanation for this symptom? Infection, nerve damage, critical limb ischemia, or muscle strain? Well, I know Berger's disease is a circulation problem. Now, generally, I don't see it in the limbs, although it certainly the, the patient I was telling you about had both his arms amputated and both his legs amputated, y'all. Um, and so it can affect the limbs. I mean, it's going to affect the most distal place, right? So if the feet are gone, it can affect the, then it just keeps getting closer and closer to the central area. So 
pain with walking or pain with exercise indicates a circulation problem. It's called intermittent claudication when someone has pain in their legs while they're walking and then it goes away when they stop. That's called intermittent claudication. So intermittent claudication is pain, cir circulation pain in the extremities with exercise. But if they have pain at rest, that's way worse. If, this, if you don't even have enough circulation to provide oxygen to the tissues at rest, that's critical limb ischemia. Okay, critical limb ischemia. So it goes from intermittent claudication to critical limb ischemia. That's getting worse. So they may have been having, they may have some necrosis of their toes, but maybe they've lost some feeling in their toes. They're, they ignore it, or maybe they've had their toes amputated. Maybe they've even had their feet amputated, and now they're getting pain in their leg at rest. That's when you're like, uh oh, we may have to amputate that leg now. That's how it progresses if you don't stop smoking. Okay. Well, I hope that was helpful to you. Burger's disease is interesting to me just because I've seen people with Burger's disease. And I've seen kind of the worst case scenarios. I worked at a large teaching hospital uh, where they would kind of see all the worst case scenarios. That's why I saw a patient who'd had all four limbs amputated from Berger's disease. That's not something you're typically going to see um, at most hospital systems. So anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Good luck on your NCLEX and see you later.